zero. It's a positive entropy, so that means everything has a higher probability if it is more, um, um, if, if, if it has less order. So for me, that was always a problem, and isn't there a big discrepancy uh, between evolution and that law of entropy? Shouldn't there be a neck entropy? There's much, um, uh, much argument about this, and um, uh, it's a question of uh, physics, which is really, uh, you know, uh, even more outside the scope of what I have a right to uh, talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the, um, if, um, uh, I will, nonetheless, uh, try to say a lot of amount of wisdom on it. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the second law of thermodynamics, or the entropy principle, you know, so it essentially is like set clutch run down rather than up. You have to wind them up uh, um, in order to get them into a high state of ordered energy. And uh, one of the common objections to uh, uh, evolutionary theory, which is always denounced as ridiculous by the official establishment, is that the whole process violates the um, uh, second uh, law of thermodynamics of increasing uh, entropy. And um, in, um, in, in response to that, it's always pointed out that you can have a, an increase in ordered energy, that is a decrease in entropy, which means an increase in the order of the energy, in one part of, this, of, a, of a system, provided that there, it's compensated for by a net um, increase in entropy somewhere else. So um, that, uh, the, the claim is that the Earth is taking in energy from the sun, and um, uh, that uh, this balances the accounts, as it were. There's a breakdown of the order of energy in the sun that compensates for the uh, buildup of, uh, of order on the Earth. This assuming that this process of evolution, by the way, is occurring, but then the, the argument goes it wouldn't uh, uh, violate to the second uh, law. Now, um, it's, what, whether or not this is related to the second law or to a different point, um, it seems to me, and again, many commentators have pointed this out, including quite a number from official science, from establishment science, this is no far out position, that this position, this leaves something out of the equation, um, uh, just simply to say that. Because, as, as one of the uh, people put it, you can have the sun shining on a junkyard um, for centuries, and all it produces is warm junk. It doesn't cause the pieces to come together into an airplane. Um, and that is, you need something, but you don't you need more than energy inflow. You need a way of organizing the energy inflow. Uh, another a common statement about this, again, from the, the establishment side, is you get this increase in order, decrease in entropy, every time you see the baby grow from fertilized embryo into an adult human being. You see, there's a tremendous buildup. But there again, of course, the important thing is that you have the organizing system in the information which is contained in the genetic program in that baby's genes, which is passed down from the parent. And without that, the decrease in entropy, the increase in order doesn't occur. So the question then becomes, what is there in the earth um, that can do this with, let us say, inert chemicals that don't have genetic information in them uh, to make them uh, uh, into a, uh, 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 an order of this system. Is there something or isn't there? Well, there's a whole branch of science right now which operates, which attempts to do computer models of how an evolutionary process could work. Many of the scientists in this, many of them are physicists and mathematicians rather than bi bi uh, biologists. And they tend to, there's place very little emphasis on natural selection or even to prove the whole idea. And they simply claim that um, uh, based on, I think, very inadequate evidence, and many people share that view, um, that, um, the, um, uh, that nature simply has these self-ordering principles which cause order to arise without you having to have natural selection involved in it, and that you can model this on a computer by making all the right assumptions, of course, and show things getting more uh, and more uh, complex uh, all the time. Now, you know, I, I'm simply, uh, um, uh, from a layman's point of view, and I'd be glad to be better educated on this from some who are better informed, if the second law of thermodynamics is consistent with the existence of self-ordering systems that create more and more complexity, a decrease in entropy all the time, in any system which is open to energy flowing in from the outside, then it seems to me the second law isn't a very interesting law. <laughs> because uh, I don't see what important application it has anyway. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, other than the universe as a whole. Um, so uh, I'm looking at that problem, if that's, yeah. the, if that's the explanation. But Do you want to add to that? Yeah, that's very interesting, because that would have, if you say that's not 
important as the second law of thermodynamics that could have influences now on physics mm -hmm. coming from yeah. Yeah. Now, as I say, I, in Science Magazine did an article last year on this research that I've just referred to into the computer modeling of the so, so evolution of complex systems through, you know, self-ordering, you know, self-ordering systems. Yes. And uh, what uh, what all of the uh, biologists said was, well, this will be an interesting thing if they can ever connect it to the real world by experimental evidence, but that remains to be done. And I, my, as I read their literature, what they're doing, you see, the, the reason why they assume that these systems must exist, it's, it's, the, it's they're lifting themselves by their own bootstraps. They're saying, we're here, and we wouldn't be if they didn't exist. You say, life wouldn't exist if there weren't, if, if, if there weren't this tendency of things to order themselves into more complex forms. That is not the only evidence, but that's the, but, but the evidence that they have is, you know, it has to do with, with ordering of such a minor nature that it doesn't seem to be carry the point. And that's what I, uh, you know, my, my reflection on it, if, uh, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm always glad to be better educated by, um, on, on any of these topics, if I can do that. Did I see, I saw your hand back in the red shirt. Yes, I was curious, what are you going to do for the necessary for some things? There you have a local increase in it doesn't seem to me that any supernatural mm -hmm. yeah. ordering principle is involved in that. Yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, there, there's a whole literature on this. Um, and, uh, uh, for um, uh, the, um, the the people who take roughly the same you know general line that I do, but that are much better informed in uh, the chemistry and physics of the you know precise questions which you're answering are um, uh, 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 Charles Saxon, Walter Bradley, and uh, Roger. I think it is Olson in their book, The Mystery of Life's Origin, which goes into these questions in great detail. And uh, isn't a mystery. I mean, well. Yeah, but snowflakes, snowflakes are not uh, biological cells either. What you have is the same thing doing itself over and over again. It's like, you know, getting a book that has the same letter or the same word repeated over and over again throughout the book. And the question is, is that the same kind of system that can get you the plays of Shakespeare? So the laws of the plank of water don't necessarily work on carbon? I didn't say that at all. I didn't say anything like that. I said the question is what kind of self-ordering systems are, are they and whether they uh, present the kind of specified complexity that's uh, uh, required. And that's uh, uh, very much uh, undemonstrated. Um, that's, that's what the snowflakes are, and, and the crystals are what I had in mind as to the other evidence besides the assumption that life was uh, produced, which, however, is just not ordering of the, you know, of the kind of magnitude required to do this uh, sort of job. And it doesn't get more and more so. It just does the same thing over and over again. Uh, yeah. Um, if I remember correctly, you said that one of the things that um, treated or that proved that Darwinism was pseudoscience was that you don't get reproducibility that physics and chemistry do with regards to their experiments. Well, no, I, I um, um, would not have said and did not say, um, and I would not say that that made it pseudoscience because in judging, I mean, you know, it, uh, something you have to take account of the realities of the problem that they've got. You can't make unreasonable demands. Now, even at best, however, without going into pseudo, um, in, in the eyes of its leading practitioners, this is a point that Steve Gould makes often, that um, evolutionary biology, you know, he calls it a historical science, because it deals with unique and unrepeatable events of the past, um, rather than things which you, know, you can test by reproducible experiments in the, in the, uh, in, in the present. Now, that may be perfectly genuine, I mean, perfectly legitimate to do as best you can research into unique events of the past, but it doesn't mean that you can do it by this reliable means as you can test something like somebody's claim to have invented cold, you know, fusion in, in the present, yeah. But, however, I mean, the past uh, 50 years or so, there have been uh, a fair few, um, not fair few, but a few cases where evolution was in, induced by humans, for example, um, the effect of penicillin on, say, gonorrhea, or the effect of DDT on various pests that develop resistance to the drug when, yes. when exposed sure. to them. I'm glad you make that point, because that, that's going to take me right back to one of the, the beginning points. What is evolution? And how does the meaning of this word change? Now, there's no question at all in my mind, um, or in the mind of any of the people that I'm associated with, you know, raising questions about uh, that, that evolution happens in the sense in which you meant it, if that's what you mean by evolution. Now, that's the important thing, you know, is the meaning of the word. Now, no one disputes 
that bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics and insects to insecticide. Uh, no one disputes that you get all these breeds of dogs. The question is, is this the same process that produces bacteria in the first place, writ small, you know, so, uh, and, uh, or not? That is, does it, can you extrapolate it to get the great creative powers that are necessary to produce uh, everything? And that's the point that I went into at the beginning. Not only is it not established that you can, um, but in fact, um, the evidence is decidedly to the contrary. The change that you get is of limited type within the type, and the variation runs out before you run out of the time. After all, bacteria are supposed to have, have changed very little from, uh, as far as anyone can tell, from uh, their original appearance 3.8 billion years ago uh, on, uh, on the Earth, the fruit fly. Uh, Pierre Grasset was president of the French Academy, one of the world's best known zoologists, who poo pooed all of the claims of Darwinism. And he said, you know, the fruit fly, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, the pet insect of the geneticists, this is what they do all our experiments on, they very fast generation times, um, which, um, you know, they made the drop wings and do multiple legs and all that. It says, is itself hardly changed at all since the most ancient times. And uh, so once you look at the question with an open mind, I think, there's, there is no good reason to believe that these microprocesses can legitimately be expanded to describe the creative process that produced all of these things in the first place. Now that load is carried not by scientific evidence, but by a trick of semantics. Because we use the word evolution. Evolution means small changes within the type of the, of the, of the example I use, you know, the same type as yours was the peppered moss uh, a case, that we call that evolution. We use the same word to describe the process that we imagine to have made life in the first place, and to have produced humans and fruit flies and um, uh, peppered moths and um, uh, trees and all of those things. So when you say, well, we've demonstrated that, that uh, you evolved resistance to insecticides, well, that's evolution. We've proved evolution. And we know what evolution is. It's this whole grand process. So instead of carefully looking at the evidence, we get carried away by uh, what I, could, I think I would call semantic inflation in the value of the word. So uh, I say that we, we ought not to make that assumption. The word is misleading when it's used, you know, so you see, with both such narrow and such broad meanings. It's like an accordion. It can be narrowed or expanded at will. Um, so th there's no question that the small-scale change to the type you're describing occur. What would it take you to believe that we're going to do this? Oh, uh, a great uh, uh, question. Um, and this is one I put throughout the book, uh, you know, in, in effect. What's the question? What, what would it take for me to believe in Darwinian evolution? Um, and um, it seems to me the theory would, would what, what one would have found is two things. Um, the first was a test which T.H. Huxley set right at the beginning. He said, I accept Darwin's theory provisionally. He said, but I think, you know, this is subject to my belief that it will prove to be true that you can produce new animal species by selective breeding. Now, in fact, that was never made, at least in any unambiguous case, that while you can produce considerable variation within the type, and, you know, dogs, whatever, all dogs are biochemically in interfertile and uh, are, uh, in, by that definition, in a single uh, species. I don't think producing a, a new species would be enough. I, I disagree with Huxley in that, because um, a, a species is just a separated brood breeding community. What you really want is clear evidence that it can produce major innovation. But what would convince me um, would be if the process of change appeared to be continuing steadily in various directions, you see, so that, after all, we've had 130 years to test it, uh, so that you could have some good uh, uh, reason for thinking it would continue as long as there was time available. It's the fact that the change stops long before the time stops that makes me unconvinced. So that's, you know, it, it's a proof along the same order of what Huxley specified, which was never produced. Uh, but I would have, you know, in fact, required a bit more than, than Huxley stated. I'd be a little harder to convince. The second thing is this, is with, with respect to the fossils. And this is a question I ask directly in the book. Suppose that it's 1859, and suppose that you are a fair-minded, intelligent reader of the origin of species. And you know that Darwin is opposed, not just by some clergymen, but by all the leading fossil experts of his day, which he acknowledged to be the case. You can read that in the 
origin and, uh, and, and uh, check that out. Um, among the leading opponents of Darwin's system was Professor uh, Louis Agassiz, the most prominent uh, natural historian in the world at Harvard. Agassiz said it was all wrong, it couldn't happen that way. Now suppose that you're reading this and you want to be fair to both Darwin and Agassiz. This is the question that I, I put. And um, uh, you know that uh, Darwin in the origin says the fossil record um, is incomplete. It's against me, but it's not fatal because Darwin said, we haven't explored enough fossil beds. We haven't known what to look for. Well then, what would you predict would be the case after 130 years of fossil exploration by thousands and thousands of paleontologists who are almost all dedicated Darwinists um, desiring very much to establish the theory? Well, it seems to me what you would expect to find as hundreds of times, you know, of fossil beds were explored to manifold increase in information, you get hundreds of millions of fossils by now that are discovered, you would expect that the fossil record would look a lot more Darwinian than it did in 1859. That knowing what to look for and doing all that exploration, they would find lots of examples of things that appeared to be transitionals, documenting a transition from one kind of thing to another. You wouldn't expect to find it in every case. You'd expect a lot to be missing because you know, fossilization is a sometime thing and all of that. But you would expect that the problem would be getting better all the time. And now, in, in uh, uh, about 1975 or so, Professor David Ralph of the University of Chicago and the world's leading paleontologist wrote a statement that's much quoted. He said, in fact, it's getting worse all the time. That we have fewer fossil intermediates than we had. He said in Darwin's time, but I think it, it, it would have been, it probably really meant a few decades after Darwin's time, when, when uh, uh, when many successes were claimed, um, and they have turned out to be unsubstantiated. So, in, in fact, um, that was what necessitated the punctuated equilibrium episode, was that in, in uh, the 1970s, looking at it again, after more than a century of attempts to confirm the theory, what did you see? You saw things coming into the record suddenly, and then you saw them staying fundamentally unchanged. The stasis is much more important than the sudden appearance. Because you can always explain the sudden appearance by saying, well, the transitionals were there, but they didn't get recorded. They once existed, but they didn't get fossilized. The stasis is positively documented. Things that were here hundreds of millions of years ago, either, until they went extinct, or if they're still here until today, stay fundamentally as they were. And that's the stasis. Now, supposedly, their cousins were, you know, the, the cousins of um, the uh, coelacanth, the, a living fossil fish, uh, the close cousins that were supposedly evolving into amphibians and reptiles and then people, you know, eventually at the end of it, um, while these ones stayed fundamentally the same. So that's why I'm not convinced, and, and of course what would convince me would be if, as you would expect with a true theory, if the paleontologists kept saying, Eureka! We would have known that what this was, but now we can see what it is, and if they found again and again um, the kinds of things that the people whose existence the theory would predict. Um, and uh, that's that's the answer. What well, that's what we convinced me. Are you familiar with how the case study all the things that might have happened? You mentioned one. Mm -hmm. How they deal about the fossil evidence thing? Uh, they're all over the place on this. Uh, the uh, the best known paleontologists, the ones best known to the general public, are people like um, uh, David Rao, um, like. Um, Stephen Jay Gould, Mike Niles Eldridge, and uh, Stephen Stanley, um, uh, because they've done books for the general reader, and they are very prominent scientists as well. And these are all people who um, um, acknowledge, uh, pretty frankly, the non-Darwinian character of the fossil record and its appearance, and then who have, you know, have, have proposed um, uh, hypotheses of the punctuated equilibrium variety and genetic mechanisms involving changes in the genes that regulate embryonic development and it might create you know, big changes with a simple be beginning or something, but they acknowledge, um, th that is to say, they, they, they think something drastic, fairly drastic, has to be done to modify Darwinian theory, uh, uh, to add to it in some way to make it consistent with the fossils. But I don't think that those people are, are necessarily typical of the great mass of paleontologists out there, as I gather from conversations from other reading that, and, and uh, um, a lot just are simply content to say that uh, we never expected that the fossil record would do anything more than show that evolution, whatever that might mean, has occurred. You know, that new things have appeared. 
and that they're more or less related to what went in the past, and the fossil record is so poor that you just shouldn't expect it to show anything. Now, you know, that, that, that's, that's a position that one can take, but of course it leaves me with, well, how do we know that it happened? Uh, 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 but that, that's how I, I'd summarize my understanding of it. Uh, but there's so much there, you know, um, uh, one of the things I've taken an interest in recently, I've just written a, a little short paper about, is the mass extinctions and uh, reviewing a book. I, I, and uh, um, the, um, um, the guy who wrote this book, David Ralph, who I mentioned before, wrote a book in, uh, a few years ago uh, called The Nemesis Affair about a theory that there are periodic mass extinctions caused by asteroids that circle a distant star and so on. But in, in that book, he reported a poll that was taken at a meeting of the American Geological Society, where they had all the geologists and the paleontologists together. And it was, it was hilarious to read. Because uh, it was something like, you know, 27% thought that there was an extinction at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, that mass extinction was caused by an asteroid. And, and uh, uh, 19 and a half percent thought that there was a mass extinction, but it wasn't caused by an asteroid. And, and uh, a 22 and 3 quarters percent thought that there was an asteroid but no mass extinction. And, uh, 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 you know, the rest thought the question was meaningless. Or, uh, <laughs> but it was a kind of spread that you would, you would get if you asked uh, the, you know, the American public a question about flying saucers or something. And it, it indicated that, that there was nothing remotely approaching, uh, you know, a consensus on on some fairly broad things we went through. Um, yeah. I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. I was a letter follow-up. Uh, this is actually a very general question. You can You raised a lot of interesting issues and, and questions, and I guess my sense is that you sort of thrown them out for our thinking. If you had someone who was particularly interested in pursuing it, what would your suggestion be in terms of not specifically or maybe specifically I mean, besides reading my book. Themselves. Well, that's uh, what I tried to make it very uh, um, practical to do from the book, because besides the chapters of text, I have the chapters in the back of the book of research notes, which are a guide to the reading that I did, and uh, which, uh, you know, it, it, uh, uh, are, uh, I, I don't say a complete uh, guide to the literature, because that, that would be a really oppressive and excessive, but a, uh, a, a very substantial sampling of the literature that anyone could follow. Um, it's not at all uh, impossible to do, because so much of it appears even the professional literature, the stuff that's done for other scientists, the bulk of the stuff that's really of interest to the non-specialist appears in two journals. Uh, Nature, which is the leading British scientific journal, and Science, the leading American scientific journal. And most of that stuff is it's written for general scientists, you see, who are lay people with respect to any specialty other than their own. So it's, it's quite readable. Um, and so it's not at all uh, difficult to follow, even the stuff that the, you know, that the scientific profession is following. And there's a lot of books about it for the general reader. Now, the problem is that the books for the general reader are almost entirely written by people who are trying to sell the theory. And, you know, that they're saying, you should believe, you should believe. And then there's the literature, which is actually hard to get a hold of, from the creation science people, you know, who have their, their uh, angle. Um, from the, the kind of approach that I am taking, there are about four, I think, um, books, of the, you know, but three besides my own, that, um, I think are particularly um, uh, uh, significant. Um, one is Michael Denton's Evolution of Theory and Crisis, and taking the same roughly general view that I do. Bax and Bradley and Olson's The Mystery of Life's Origin, which deals with chemical origin, is a little tough for a non-chemist. It's, it's really a bit more than for the general reader, but it's uh, quite good. Uh, and a, a lawyer predecessor of mine, Norman Macbeth's A Darwin Retried, which is a very witty and charming book. Um, that sort of pokes uh, a little fun at the theory and is, but it's, it, I think, quite soundly reasonable. So um, those are the books I, I think we'll recommend, the ones that take my kind of view. Then, you know, Gould, if you want to get the official sign point of view, the stuff by Gould and Dawkins in particular. And I, I highly recommend Doug uh, Fatuma's um, a book, which is a real, you know, I'm plan bag make the case for the official theory. That's a good job of marching the evidence. Yes. I have a question. I have a couple comments, and I don't necessarily solicit a reply. Um, 
One is about the business of our stasis that you made.